It was a dark and stormy night. I always wanted to start the story like this. This time it was dark and cloudy both outside the window and inside my heart. My wife, with whom I lived for five years, was in a coma in the hospital. I was planning to return there soon. Two days ago she had an accident and my three. Year. Old son died. The man who was with her also died. I didn't know all the details yet since it happened on Friday night. I was working second shift at a factory and received a call from the hospital. The man's wife was also in the hospital. She was a beautiful woman, even in her old blouse and jeans. She cried over her loss, as did I. We talked for a bit without really knowing each other. We knew we would have to meet again and see what we could figure out. Now everything was in limbo. Was this a meeting? Did they have an affair? I just didn't know or understand why Lydia took our son with her. So many questions and not a single answer. I hope all issues will be resolved in the coming days. I was at home and changing clothes when the phone rang. It was a hospital. Lydia was coming out of a coma, but the doctors did not think that she would survive. Too much internal damage. I rushed to the hospital as quickly as possible. I was immediately admitted to the intensive care unit. Her mother left the room crying when I entered. In the hall were her two brothers and their wives, as well as her younger sister and father. Lydia was in a substance-induced state. Her voice was just a whisper. She looked at me with half-closed eyes and said, Derek, I feel so bad. She left. Her last words were, Derek, I feel so. Perhaps. I'm sorry. I don't know. I guess I'll never know. My problem is that my name is Jerry. I left the room in tears. Her whole family was crying in the hall. What is happening to me? Losing my son and now my wife. It seems so unreal. I wanted to wake up from this nightmare. Unfortunately, it was not a dream. I hugged all my relatives. What could I tell them? I didn't know anything. Now I had other problems. On Tuesday, I had to bury my three. Your old son and on Wednesday, my now wife of five years. I had no answers. Everything had to be postponed until after the funeral. When I got home, my answering machine was so full of messages that it stopped accepting them. Friends and family kept asking. The police and insurance companies also called. My head was a mess. I just sat down in my chair and cried. I finally dozed off when my phone rang. The call display read D. Kane. I decided to answer. Hello, Johnson residents. I answered. Mr. Johnson. Jerry Johnson. Yes, it's me. Who's talking? I asked. This is Connie. Connie Kane. My husband was killed in an accident along with your son. And now I heard that your wife did not survive. I just wanted to express my condolences to you. I know how hard this is for you. Since I am going through a similar, now I'm completely upset. She started crying. Connie, I'm sorry for your loss too. I'd really like to meet you and we could exchange notes or something. I've got two funerals going on right now. I'll be choir. I will have my son on Tuesday and Lydia, my wife on Wednesday. Maybe we can meet after this. I really want to talk to you. Jerry, can I call you Jerry? Of course, Connie. My husband's funeral is also on Tuesday. So any time after that will be fine. Connie, can I ask you a couple of questions? Please, Jerry, I'm as shocked as you are. Anything I can do to help find answers to these unresolved questions I'm willing to do. Did you know my wife? Her name was Lydia Johnson. Before her marriage, she was Lydia Moore. Also, your husband's name was Derek. On a personal note, how long have you been married and do you have a family? Jerry, I'm not sure, but I think your wife sold us our house about four years ago. I can confirm the exact date if you need. I've never seen or heard her name since. Not even Derek mentioned her. We were married nine years and we have two children. A boy, Dylan, who is seven, and a girl, Dala, who is five. Were you or maybe your husband interested in buying real estate or another home? We often talked about buying a summer house, but I don't know whether he was interested in it or not. As I said, it was just talk. Did you know if he was with someone last Friday? Do you know if he had a meeting or work scheduled on Friday? As far as I know, Jerry, no, he often came home late, so I didn't suspect anything until the hospital called. Thank you, Connie. I've bothered you enough for now, and I'm so sorry for your loss. I just hope we can find some answers to close this chapter. It was a pleasure talking to you, and again, I'm so sorry. I hung up one connection for now. 
she could have sold them their house four years ago. At least I have somewhere to start poor Connie, two children, and now without a father. I really felt sorry for her. My life wasn't the only one that was in disarray. Even though it was Sunday, the insurance company left me a message asking me to call them back. They asked for more information than I had at the time. I'll have to get a police report and contact them again. At this point, I both loved and hated Lydia. She was my loving wife and mother of my only child. Now they are both gone. The grief was so intense that I couldn't even think clearly. I tried to remember our happy moments together. How to cope with all these emotions at the same time. I needed to clear my head to cope with losses and funerals. God, how I wish this damn phone would stop ringing. I listened to most of the messages and then turned off the ringer and left the answering machine to take calls again. I needed rest. I haven't slept much since the accident. I walked over to the sofa. I didn't want to lie in my bed and lay down thinking about my life until I fell asleep. Lydia and I met when she was still in, well, junior college. She studied real estate. I worked in a factory as a maintenance assistant. I was in an apprenticeship program to become a maintenance mechanic. We did plumbing and electrical and car repairs. This was the highest paying hourly job in our eye company. At least I had the brains to get into this program. Lydia and I dated for about two years before I proposed to her. We got married a few months later. She was selling real estate and I was working the second shift in maintenance. We didn't see each other often, but we had a good understanding. We spent all our free time together. We made love at the first opportunity. I would come home around midnight and wake her up and we would make love. Sometimes it was just sex. We were a good couple. She never complained about me waking her up for sex. After we finished, she would just snuggle up to me and go back to sleep. What more could a man want? Lydia made her biggest sale and we went out to celebrate. When we got home, we had the best sex ever. We did this three times a night. The first time was for me, but Lydia wanted more. This was the first time we did this three times in about eight hours. Nine months later, little Mikey, our son, was born. He was our pride and joy. I spent a lot of time with him during the day when she had to work, and of course she took care of him when I left for work. Everyone was arguing about who he looked like. Opinions were evenly divided. Half said Mikey looked like me, and the other half said, he looked more like Lydia. We didn't care who he looked like. He was our pride and joy. Lydia wanted to spend more time with Mikey and me, so she started working part-time. I liked it because I also wanted her to be at home. Life was good. We fought like any other married couple. We didn't have girls only or boys only nights. We preferred to go out together as a family, or we often visited our families. As I already mentioned, Lydia had two brothers and a sister. My mother was alive and remarried. Dad died when I was about five. I had one sister, a couple of years younger, who was also married and had one daughter. We have never had problems finding a nanny. We had a lot of people interested. I guess that's another reason why I thought it was strange that Lydia took Mikey with her that night. Someone would probably agree to look after him. What I heard was that she didn't mention to anyone that she was going out. On Monday, I called my boss, who already knew about the death of members of my family. I told him I needed a couple of weeks to get things in order. Of course, he sympathized with me and said that I could take as much time as I needed. The first five days would be considered family leave, and then I could use whatever leave I needed. If I needed more time, I just needed to call him. Most of the next couple of days will be spent at the funeral home, it couldn't have been worse. On Tuesday, when I saw the lifeless body of my son lying there, I cried and cried. No parent should have to bury their children. It's just not fair. Of course, all the family and friends asked questions about Lydia and Derek. What could I say? I didn't know anything. Eventually, they got the hint and didn't mention it to me again. I knew that there was a lot of gossip going on behind my back. After Mikey's funeral that morning, I found myself at another funeral home, where another funeral was about to take place. I stood at the back of the room, still in my black suit, and just watched people. I didn't know anyone, but I wanted to hear the gossip. Who was that woman with him? Did he have another affair? Poor Connie, 
Now she's raising two small children on her own. I assumed that this was the type of conversation that happened at Mikey's funeral and would be the same at Lydia's funeral. It wasn't his first time, you know. Connie caught him before. Connie said he was looking at real estate. Well, of course, a convenient excuse. Connie looks really good even in black. I wonder if she was just like old Derek. Damn, if I had a woman like Connie at home, I definitely wouldn't be looking for adventures on the side. Did you hear that there was a child in the car? I had enough. I was about to leave when Connie noticed me. She quickly approached me. I should have gotten closer, but I didn't want all these people wondering who I was. Jerry, why are you here? She hugged me. I don't know. I just buried my son and ended up here. I'm so sorry, Jerry. Nothing could be worse than burying your child. Here are my two children in front, waiting for the service to begin. Jerry, please call me on Thursday. We need to talk. I know you hear rumors. Please come, just call first. She handed me a card with her address and phone number. The service was about to start, so I quickly left. I stopped by my sister's, where there was something like a wake for Mikey. What it came down to was feeding a lot of people before they went home. There was almost no talk about my son. In the minds of most of these people, he will be forgotten in a couple of days. He will forever remain in my heart. After eating, I headed back to Lydia's for the evening hours, pain and heartbreak over and over again. It was more of the same. Whispers, people who stopped talking when I walked past. I almost wished that someone would run up to me and say, Your wife was having an affair with Derek. Here's the proof. I knew this wouldn't happen. I didn't even know if there was an affair. I'd endured a terrible three hours in the funeral home and knew I had to do it again in the morning. I was glad when it ended. Lydia's mother organized a wake at her home this time. As I ate, I realized that I would no longer spend much time with this family. What's the point? Their daughter and grandson are now dead. All I would imagine for them is bad memories. I think we all understood this, but no one mentioned it. I left after eating and returned home. We bought it when it came on the market. It was a small house that needed a lot of repairs. He had a nice backyard that we fenced in for Mikey. I looked out the back door and saw his swing. I couldn't count how many times he asked me to push him on the swing. Now, I knew that I had the terrible task of sorting through all his belongings and clothes. I decided to call Lydia's sister and sisters-in-law so they could pick up any of Lydia's clothes and personal items. They said they would come in the evening. They came and rummaged through Lydia's closets and drawers. I have already looked through them, looking for something that could help me in my search for information. I let my sister Lydia take the engagement ring to give to my daughter. I didn't need it. When the women finished rummaging through everything, they hugged and kissed me goodbye. I also let them take little Mikey's clothes. When they were finished, I collected the remaining clothes and put them in trash bags. I'll take them to the Salvation Army tomorrow. At about nine o'clock in the evening, the phone rang. Hello. Hey, Jerry. It's Connie again. I didn't want to bother you, but I needed to tell you that I was there today. Connie, it's not a bother to talk to you. In fact, you're the only person who understands what's going on. Where were you today? At the funeral, Lydia's funeral. Yes, Jerry. I stood back and listened to the terrible conversations. It seems that everything has already been decided for us, doesn't it? Connie, don't worry about what others think. They want the worst because it's better for gossip. Why didn't you come forward? No one would have known who you were. I walked over and looked at her. Jerry, she was a beautiful woman. She was also the woman who sold us our house four years ago. I didn't see you coming. I waited until you left the room. Then I walked over and prayed for you. I left a minute or two after that. Connie, you think they were having an affair, don't you? I don't know, Jerry. Maybe they did, but I have absolutely no proof of that right now. Will we see you tomorrow? Yeah, I'll call you after I get to the police station. They left a message on the answering machine that the accident report is ready. So I'll see you tomorrow, Connie. Good night, Jerry. She hung up. I spent another night on the couch. I knew that eventually I would have to sleep in a bed. First, I needed to remove Lydia's personal belongings from the room, which I did. I also washed the sheets and blankets. This may seem wrong, 
but I needed to get Lydia's smell out of the room. I loved her very much, but now she was gone, and I needed to move on with my life. I even rearranged the furniture in the room, so it looks different when I walk into it. I got dressed and went to the police station. I always carried a small notepad in my vest pocket to jot down any information or possible leads. I planned to do nothing for the next week except follow up on leads and try to find some answers. At the police station, it was actually the sheriff's office. I spoke with the interrogator. I asked him to explain everything to me without worrying about what I might think. Deputy Burke, I need answers. My wife and son were killed, and a man named Derek Kane was also killed. I didn't know this man. A. Perhaps there was an affair between them or maybe not. All I'm looking for is the truth. Nothing can be changed now. M.S. Kane and I are both looking for closure to this chapter. Well, Mr. Johnson, when I arrived on scene, we found a car overturned and falling into a ditch down the hill. Our best guess is that your wife was driving the car and was traveling at an excessive speed and missed the turn. There were signs of breaking around the turn, which tells us that it was unintentional. The deputy looked at me. That rules out suicide. Were they fully clothed, sir? Or did it appear that they might have been doing something intimate at that moment? I asked no. Both were fully clothed. There were no signs of any intimate activity. They died when the car flipped over several times, ending up with the roof down. I can't provide you with any other information at this time. Thank you, officer. Mr. Johnson, I have a couple of questions for you. Do you have any idea where they might be going? We thought they were coming from the city. We're trying to figure out where they met. Mrs. Kane said her husband's car was still parked outside his office. We thought, Mrs. Johnson might have come there to pick him up. She probably picked him up there. My wife was in, or should I say, in real estate sales. They may have been looking at properties. I'd like to know. If I find anything, I'll be sure to let you know. Please keep me in touch, of course, if you find anything. One more thing, Mr. Johnson. Your insurance company has requested the vehicle to inspect it. We need your consent to hand it over. I'd like to inspect it myself first. I'm going to the insurance company later and will take the permit with me. That's normal for me. If we find anything else, we will contact you, the officer said. After leaving the sheriff's department, I called Connie. Hello, Connie. This is Jerry. I got some information from the police. I'm heading to the insurance company now. Jerry, can I meet you at the insurance company? For what? They called me and asked me to come. I guess they want to settle the situation with me. Depending on your wife's policy, they have to pay medical expenses and compensation for personal injuries. I really don't want to go there alone. Connie, you're going to sue me and you want me there while you do it. Jerry, Derek worked in the insurance business. I'll explain to you later. But yes, in a sense, I'm suing you. I won't take anything from you, Jerry. Believe me, whatever I get from the insurance, I'll put it aside for my children. They come first for me. You must understand this. I promise I will not take anything from you. Okay, Connie, for some reason I trust you. Just don't use me. I want us to help each other, not be at odds. Trust me, Jerry. You are the last person I would want to hurt. You are an unwitting witness to this whole disaster. I will meet you at the insurance company office in about an hour. I need to take the children to my mother. I waited for Connie in the insurance company parking lot. I didn't know much about insurance, so I hope that she was honest with me. All I have left is my house and personal belongings. I had six years left in my retirement account, but I knew no one could touch it. I also had about ten zero, zero zero in the savings program the company offered. It wasn't the loss of these few material things that bothered me. It was the loss of the only person with whom I could share my experiences at the moment. Connie pulled up in her van. She walked up to my car and got into it. Jerry, I need to explain this insurance situation to you. I want you to know that I won't take anything from you. I need you to understand that. Is that why you're looking at me like that? Jerry, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. I'm sorry, Connie. I'm really sorry. I looked at you like that. It was the first time I saw you other than in a state of distress. You're a beautiful woman. God, I'm so sorry. I looked at you like that. I have no right to look at you this way. 
Jerry, it's okay. I just hated the idea that you might think I was trying to take advantage of you, and that bothered me. Thanks for the compliment, by the way. Connie, I buried my wife, and now I see you. It's not right one day later. Stop torturing yourself for being human. Maybe we should get back to the topic of insurance. I'll only sue for the amount of your insurance. I'm not expecting a million-dollar lawsuit here. We'll have to look at how much coverage your wife had. We walked into the insurance office together. Jerry Johnson and Connie Kane, we're here to see Mr. Bauer. The receptionist looked up and smiled at us with a business-like smile, then called Todd Bauer. He was our agent at the insurance company. He came out and greeted us, but was surprised to see us together. I'm so sorry to hear about your wife and son, Jerry. I know this must be a tragic time for you. He looked at Connie. I'm also sorry to hear about the loss of your husband, Mrs. Kane. These are difficult times for all of us. Todd, we've both lost loved ones. Your company will lose some money, hardly comparable losses. I know you mean well and thank you for your condolences, but we want to get this whole insurance thing sorted out. These are not the most pleasant circumstances. I agree, Jerry. Would you believe it? The claims experts are in my office. Who wants to go first? If it's all the same to you, Mr. Bauer, we'll go in together. You see, we're here to support each other through our losses. Plus, my husband, Derek, was an insurance agent, and I understand politics and might be able to support Jerry in that regard, Connie said. I knew Todd was stunned. He said we could go in together, although that was not his intention. The claims adjuster looked at both of us and said, I'm sorry, but it's not good business practice to have both of you here together. I'm afraid one of you will have to leave the office. Listen, mister, whoever, I lost my wife and son. This lady lost her husband. I don't care about your damn business practices. We can either settle this insurance claim right now, or we let's collect our documents and see you in court together. The choice is yours. Okay, Mr. Johnson. I didn't mean to be so harsh at a time like this. I apologize. If you both sit down, we will resolve these grievances. Without going into too much insurance as jargon, Connie basically told the insurance company what we expected. My policy provided $100,000 of bodily injury coverage per person per accident. This is exactly what Connie requested. Of course, thanks to her knowledge of the insurance business, she got it. Claims adjuster told me that I would receive $8,000 in car payments, $5,000 in health insurance for my wife, and the same amount for my son. I had no other complaints. Connie pointed out to him the accidental death clause in my policy, which entitled me to an additional $10,000 for each loss, unless they could prove it was not an accident. The claims adjuster wasn't too pleased but he knew Connie was right. The only thing he could say in response was that the accidental death payments would not be made until they had the opportunity to inspect the vehicle for any factors that may have contributed to the accident. After the meeting, I spoke with Todd. Todd, thank you for meeting with us. Please call me if you find out any information. You can contact me when the investigation is complete. Since he was my agent and not a claims expert, he treated us with great respect and said he would contact us as soon as the claims were completed. Connie, thank you. I didn't even know I was owed money. I thought they would just pay off the car and then cancel my insurance. I need to thank you somehow. Have you had lunch yet? No, I haven't eaten much for the last few days. I think my appetite is starting to return. Do you think it's a good idea to have lunch with me? Connie, we didn't do anything wrong. We both lost family in the accident. Right now, you're the only person who understands my situation. Besides, even though I don't want to, we need to start comparing the facts. We need to find some closing time. So how about lunch? I'd love to have lunch. I have a few things I'd like to share with you. Let me just call my mom so she doesn't worry too much. I may be 32, but I'm still my mom's little girl. As we finished lunch, Connie looked at me. She was a beautiful woman, but I could see the pain in her eyes. I knew she had something to tell me. Jerry, 
I need to tell you about me and Derek. We met in college, we started dating. And before we knew it, we became lovers and then husband and wife. Two years later, we started a family. As you know, I have a son and daughter who are seven and five years old. I was basically a stay-at-home mom. I have a degree in business management, and I do billing for a doctor's clinic. That way, I can be with the kids and see them too. Derek was, or rather was, a business executive at Cop Coinsurance. He started as an agent and eventually became part of management. Connie paused for a moment. I knew it was hard for a speak. What I need to tell you is that I know about several of his affairs. I caught him more than once. I will tell you that his affairs did not last long. After the last one, about two years ago, I told him, if I ever caught him cheating again, I would take the kids and divorce him. After that, he seemed to clean up his act. So he had an affair with Lydia. I don't know, Jerry. I'd like to know for sure. I haven't found anything that links them together. Yes, we bought the house from Lydia four years ago. It's possible they could have been together, but I can't prove it. I wish I could tell you more, but I can't. She began to cry. I reached across the table and took her hands tightly in mine. Connie, you must have guessed, as I did, that my son Mikey was born about nine months after we bought your house. I remember Lydia coming home and saying she had made her biggest sale that year. Moment. We went out to celebrate and, of course, made love several times. Now, I have to wonder if Mikey was my son. In my heart, he will always be mine. But you have to understand that I need a DNA test to find out for sure. Was he my biological son? I can't accuse Lydia without proof. Lydia never did anything to make me distrust her. I also had tears in my eyes now. We both stood up and Connie hugged me like a friend. Connie... Can I continue to communicate with you? Tomorrow, I'm going to the real estate office to collect Lydia's things. Maybe I'll find something, a date, a note, a letter, something tangible. Jerry, call me anytime. I'm going to Derek's office tomorrow to pack his things and talk to his boss about his benefits. I care here. I really cared about Derek. But now, I'm a widow with two small children in my arms. The next day, I went to Lydia's office and collected her things. There was a photo of Mikey and me on her desk. All her friends were crying, and this only made my pain worse. Everyone said the same thing, call if you need anything, or tell me if I can help. I asked her friends if they knew Derek. It was a difficult question, but I had to ask it. No one said they ever knew him. I didn't know if they were telling the truth or just protecting Lydia's memory. I stopped by the DNA clinic on the way home. They checked me out and I gave them Mikey's hairbrush and toothbrush. I can't describe how hard it was. The clinic doctor said that the results would not be ready in three weeks. He mentioned that his clinic is not a TV show where you can get results in an hour. He took my contact information and told me to call him if I didn't hear from them by the end of the month. I returned home and looked through Lydia's papers. I wrote down a few numbers that appeared frequently in her phone records or in her diary. In her notebook for the Friday of the accident, there was an entry with the initials D and the time 19. I'm guessing that meant meeting Derek at 7 in the evening. Was it a meeting or an affair? I looked through her notebook again and found a similar entry from a month and a half ago on Friday. Exactly the same information. D at 6. What did that mean? That evening I called Connie and told her I got tested. I also told her about Lydia's appointment book. She said she hadn't had time to look through Derek's things yet. She had to sign a bunch of insurance forms and visit Social Security to begin filing a claim for the children. I asked if I could see her, but she said relatives were coming over the weekend and a visit probably wasn't the best idea. I told her I'd call her next week, or she could call me after she looked at Derek's appointment books. We said our goodbyes, and I continued to look for clues about what happened. Several days have passed, and I have made no progress in drawing conclusions. I received a list of all properties for sale within a 20-mile radius of the accident site. My God, there are so many seats for sale. I remembered Connie saying that Derek had mentioned the possibility of buying a cottage. So I started there. This narrowed the list significantly. I got into my pickup truck and started driving around these cottages. I had a photo of Lydia with me to see if she was selling any of these properties. 
The funny thing I learned about real estate sales is that an agent can sell any property listing. Not just those in his agency, but from all agencies. The commission is simply divided between the two agencies. I looked at about 12 objects headed to the next one, which was a cottage called Valley View, where an older gentleman said he remembered Lydia asking to see the property for a client. He said it was a couple of months ago. He mentioned to me that he told the young lady that he would be away, and he gave her the key to the facility. He showed me around. It was a small three-room cottage fully furnished. I couldn't take my eyes off the bed in the bedroom. The gentleman saw me looking and said he had clean underwear in his drawer for those stopping by. He still rented it out by the day if anyone was interested. He meant tuning that she saw him again last week and is scared to see him again. He put the key in the mailbox for her but didn't think she'd come. I told him it was my wife and that she was the one who was killed that weekend. She was probably going to show the object again. He expressed his condolences to me, and I moved on. Finally, I realized that Lydia was going to show the object to Derek. At least I knew that this visit was hopefully on business. Connie called me on Thursday. Jerry, I'm so sorry I couldn't get in touch with you sooner. I've had a lot of my mind lately, and a lot of guests who keep coming to offer their condolences. I thought for a moment. No one has come to me since the two funerals. I received several phone calls, but no one came by. My mom and step had live in another state and moved home. I talked to them several times on the phone. No one from Lydia's family has come in since I gave them the clothes. I understand Connie. I don't expect you to drop everything just for me. I learned something else today. Is there a chance we could meet tonight or tomorrow? Tonight will be wonderful, Jerry. I'll take the kids to mom's and come over to your place if that's okay. Okay, I'll see you around six. I'll order Chinese Chinese food if you like. Yes, I love Chinese food, Jerry. See you at six. After I hung up the phone, I started cleaning the house. I ran around, washed the dishes, and even washed the floor. You would have thought that a special friend would be visiting me, and I needed to impress. What was I thinking? That's exactly what I did. I guess I wanted Connie's approval. Connie arrived right on time. She was wearing a beautiful blouse and a black skirt. She really looked good. She saw me looking at her when I greeted her. Oh, sorry. I just came from another meeting. That's why I'm dressed like that. Damn, I thought you dressed like that for me. I smiled. She looked into my eyes. She saw right through me. Even Lydia couldn't do that. I was suffering and alone a very vulnerable state. Jerry, before we start discussing what we found, I need to confide in you and say something personal. I'm here for you, Connie. You can trust me. I promise this won't go anywhere. Derek and I had a big fight. I know I told you he had affairs. I thought he might have one now, but I don't know who. We were headed for divorce and he knew it. Maybe he was looking for a place to buy to stay in the area. I don't know. The main thing I want to tell you is that I stopped loving Derek almost two years ago when I caught him having an affair with his secretary. I never could trust him after that. You need to know that I never cheated on him. Although I had opportunities. Hell, every woman has such opportunities. Why are you telling me this, Connie? I'm almost a stranger to you. Why me, Connie? I am vulnerable just like you. I lost my companion, and now I am a widow, like you. I hurt inside and want to be needed to be loved as I see in your eyes. I know that too little has passed since the death of our spouses. I know that, but I also want you to know that I will be available when you are ready. It may be loneliness talking, but I trust you, Jerry. I know you heard the conversations at the funeral. I don't want men like them. I want a man who can be faithful to me, like you were with Lydia. I can tell from your character that you have always been faithful to her, like I was to Derek. I don't know what to say. Right now, I feel like you're my only friend. I'd like to see you more often. We can just take it one step at a time. Wow. She was something, and she said what she meant. Thank goodness the doorbell rang at that moment as our dinner arrived. We sat down at the kitchen table and opened the boxes of food. Connie picked up her chopsticks and started eating. I went to the drawer and took a fork. 
She laughed and asked for one too. We seemed to just work together. After we ate, I told her about the man in the cottage. She handed me Derek's appointment book, and on that fateful Friday it said LVV-19. Why, I quickly went back to his book and looked at the Friday the man was talking about, and there it is in big bold letters LVV-18. Why, what is LVV Jerry, Lydia Valley View, that's where they were heading. So Derek wanted a cup to have a cottage, perhaps, perhaps not. They were on their way to this furnished cottage, perhaps to inspect it. Why didn't Lydia tell me? She always told me about possible sales. Why didn't Derek tell you? You're his wife. Wouldn't a man tell his wife if you are going to buy real estate? At least now we know where they were going, and that they were there once before, Connie said. Yes, almost two months ago, and no one seemed to know about it. Strange, right? I answered. We continued comparing notes. There were no connections in the past that came to the fore. Connie showed me some strange phone numbers. She said she thought some of them were casual affairs. She was unable to get phone records from his office since it was a business, so all she had were his cell phone records. I looked at Lydia's mobile phone, but the latest phone bill has not arrived yet. Connie said it was the same with Derek. We were supposed to check again in a couple of weeks when their last phone bills arrived. I walked Connie to the door. We looked at each other for a minute. She was so beautiful. She was three years older than me, but that didn't mean anything. I wanted to hug her, kiss her. Was it such a bad thing to want someone? She was about to open the door when I said, Connie, yes, Jerry, can I kiss you once? If you say no, I'll understand. She came up to me, and we kissed a light, wet kiss, slightly parted lips, and very sensual. While we were kissing, I pulled her towards me and hugged her. The kiss felt like it lasted minutes, but it was only a few seconds. As we slowly parted ways, she had tears in her eyes, as did I. Thank you, Jerry. I really needed this, me too, Connie, me too. She opened the door and left. The next week I returned to work. It was actually good. I could do something other than think about Lydia, and now Connie. I talked to Connie at least every couple of days. We didn't see each other because we both knew we were moving too fast. We became close telephone friends. She told me about her children and her parents. She hasn't heard much from Derek's parents. She periodically took the children there so they could see each other. She told me that a lot of the warmth from Derek's parents towards her children had cooled. Looks like Derek told them about a possible divorce. When I came home one evening, I was looking through my bills and came across an unpaid hospital bill. It was for fetal removal. What? What? Fetus? Was Lydia pregnant? I couldn't sleep all night. At first light of the morning, I went to the hospital to check this account. The doctor came up to me and said what kind of fetal removal it was when my wife was brought in. They told me she probably didn't even know she was pregnant. She was in a coma when she was brought in. The fetus died in the accident and had to be removed to try to save Lydia's life. He was about a month or two old. The billing department informed me that the bill would be paid by my insurance. Just after a month, they sent us a copy. They also told me that I received a copy of the invoice when Lydia's body was released. I told them it was a difficult time and maybe I didn't notice it. This reminded me to return to the DNA clinic to find out about the results of my tests. I headed there to pick them up. On the way to the clinic, I thought about the unborn child. Again, the timing was terrible. This was around the same time she was showing Derek the cottage. Damn, I would never have known that. When I arrived at the clinic, I had to wait. It seemed like hours, but it was only about half an hour. The doctor called me into his office. Here are your DNA results, Mr. Johnson, and here are your son's results. I didn't immediately catch the word son. He was your son, Mr. Johnson. I started crying. I couldn't help myself. Now it was official. Little Mikey was my son. The doctor walked around the table and patted me on the shoulder. I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, but at least it gives you closure. I thanked the doctor and left his office with my tests. I called Connie from my cell phone. Hello, Connie, I need to meet you. What's wrong, Jerry? You really sound stressed. I got the DNA results, and Connie asked. Mikey was my son. My son, Connie. The little boy who died was my Mikey. I started crying again. 
I'm so happy for you, Jerry. I know you needed that closure, and you wanted Mikey to be your son, Connie said. I want to know if you'd mind having dinner with me tonight. I kind of want to celebrate the news. Celebrate might not be the right word, but I'd like to share this with someone, and that someone is you. Okay, Jerry, let me call my mom and let her know that I'm eating out for dinner. I finally told her about you. She was a little surprised, but I think she's okay with it. Would you mind meeting her when are we going to keep the children? So I will meet the children too. They know I talk to you all the time, and they want to know what you look like. I'll be there in an hour. I need to go home and change. I'm meeting special people, and I want to look my best. Jerry, just be yourself. I know they'll love you as much as I do. I appeared at the door, and a young guy opened it. Are you Jerry? Sorry. Are you Mr. Jerry? My name is Dylan. That's exactly what I am. I extended my hand. The young guy shook it. Nice to meet you, Dylan. Your mom told me you're a big guy for your age. I bet you'd be a great baseball player. Yes, I love playing baseball. I'm a little league pitcher. Will you come to my game? I really like it, Dylan. I'll try to be there. Who's your little friend behind you? Oh, this is my little sister, Dala. She's only five. She follows me everywhere. I'm her big brother, you know. She's lucky to have a brother like you to take care of her. Hi, honey. I'm Let's See. You can call me Uncle Jerry if you want. You really are a very beautiful little girl. Dala looked at me. Do you have children, Uncle Jerry? Well, Dala, I had a son, but he died in a car accident. Just like my dad. We miss him dearly. I'm so sorry to hear that, honey. Just remember him in your heart. I do this with my son. I remember the good times in my heart. What was his name? Mikey. His name was Mikey. Connie walked to the door. Dylan, why didn't you tell me Jerry was already here? We were talking, Mom. Uncle Jerry will be coming to my games. Isn't that right, Uncle Jerry? Yes. If I don't work, that's what Dad always said. But he always worked. When are your games, Dylan? Saturday. We always have games on Saturdays. I promise I'll be there, Dylan. And I don't break my promise. Thank you, Uncle Jerry. Connie smiled. Looks like I passed my first test. Now I had to meet Mrs. George, Connie's mother. On the way to Connie's mom, Dylan asked me questions. Uncle Jerry... Are you really our uncle? No, Dylan. It's just easier for you instead of calling me Mr. Johnson all the time. Do you like my mom? She told me and Darla that you do. Yes, I really like your mother. She is a very good woman. Yes, and she's beautiful. Isn't she, Uncle Jerry? Your mom is beautiful, Dylan. You and Darla are lucky to have such a good and beautiful mom. Do you want to marry my mother, Uncle Jerry? Connie looked surprised. I think you've asked Jerry enough questions for now, Dylan. Sit back and talk to your sister until we get to Grandma's. She looked at me and laughed. We arrived at her mother's place and she introduced me. Her mom smiled and thanked me for supporting Connie during such a difficult time. I told her that it had been a very difficult time for all of us and it was good that we could support each other. Connie and I went out to dinner. I told her again about Mikey being my son and then I told her about the miscarriage. She was shocked, especially when I told her that the baby was conceived about two months ago. I told her that I hoped it was just a coincidence. On the way back to her mom's house, I parked in some sort of lover's lane. We talked some more, and then I kissed her. We kissed again and again. We were like two teenagers on a date. We stopped before things went any further. We knew we'd be together one day, but not tonight. I drove her back and we picked up the kids and I took them all home. I promised Dylan I'd be at his game on Saturday. I actually went to his game and Connie and I sat together while a lot of people were watching. Darla sat on my lap for most of the game. After the game, we all went to Wendy's for ice cream on the way home. This became a regular thing. Every Saturday I would come watch Dylan play and hold Darla on my lap. The feelings between Connie and I became stronger and stronger. We started taking the kids with us when we went out to eat. We knew that the next time we were alone, we would become closer. This was what we felt among ourselves. The following week, the news came to me like a bolt from the blue. Lydia's doctor called me. Mr. Johnson, could you come to our office today? It's extremely important. The nurse asked the doctor. What are we talking about? Lydia died. We would prefer to discuss this in person. We just discovered it. 
I'll be there in a few minutes. When I walked into the doctor's office, I asked, What's going on? Did Lydia forget to pay the bill or something? The doctor asked me to follow him to his private office. Mr. Johnson, I want to express my personal condolences to you for the loss of Lydia and Mikey. I don't know if you knew that the day Lydia died, she was at our reception. She was about two months pregnant. Yes, I found out from the hospital when she lost her baby in an accident. The doctors weren't sure if she knew about it, I replied. While Lydia was waiting for me to confirm the results, she wrote you a letter. I think she was going to give it to you. But for some reason, when she left, she forgot her receipts and the letter she wrote. We just put it in. It's her business until she gets back. Of course, no one read it until this morning. Lydia left me a letter. I'm sure she was going to take it with her, but she forgot. Our archivist was going through our files and getting ready to put Lydia's file in the deceased file. Of course, we double-checked our files first and found this letter. It's addressed to you. I started reading to confirm him, but stopped when it got to the personal stuff. Here it is, Jerry. I'm so sorry for your loss. I'll leave you alone for a few minutes while you read. When I read the letter, I was overwhelmed with emotion and started crying. I spent about fifteen minutes in the office. When I came to my senses, I went out and thanked the doctor and the archivist. I got into the car, read the letter again, and then drove on. I called Connie on my way home. Connie, I need to meet with you now. This is important, very important. What happened, Jerry? Lydia left me a letter. It was in her files at the doctor's. I think it answers a lot of questions. Come on over, Jerry. I'll take the kids to mom. Should be back in twenty minutes. Connie let me in. I sat there with a letter in my hand. I handed it to Connie for her to read. Hello, dear. I'm sitting here in the doctor's office waiting for them to double-check my test. Guess what? Mikey will have a brother or sister. I wasn't feeling very well, so I made an appointment for today. You left for work early, and I didn't have time to tell you about the visit. I hope you're happy about this. Eventually, I'll find out if it's a boy or a girl. I thought about when he was conceived. I think it was when you took me out on our anniversary two months ago. When we got home, we made love over and over again. Do you remember? The last time you were as tired was when Mikey was conceived. The doctor came back to double-check my tests, but he was pretty sure I was pregnant. It sounds funny saying that Lydia is pregnant. I haven't told anyone yet. I wanted you to be the first to know. I even took Mikey with me. I didn't find a nanny because I didn't want anyone to find out before you did. Are you already in shock? I have I have a house sale meeting tonight, so I know I'll be home a little late. I'll leave my documents and checkbook behind before I go. I sold a house to this man once before, and he seemed decent enough. I had a meeting with him a month or so ago, and he started hitting on me. I put him in his place and told him I was happily married. I think he's going through a divorce, but either way, I take Mikey with me as a form of protection. Well, yes, my three. You're old as protection. Actually, the guy is not that bad, but I want to keep it strictly to the point. I'll probably come home before you and go to bed. If you take care of our checkbook this evening, as you promised me, then you will see this letter. Otherwise, I'll tell you in the morning. Jerry, I love you, and I hope you are happy about the news of the baby. I have to go. The doctor is back with my tests. I see his smile. Lydia is pregnant. Love you. Lydia Connie was crying. We finally got closure. As far as we know, nothing happened between Lydia and Derek. She wanted to sell the cottage and exceeded the speed limit and lost control. We think she mistook me for Derek at the hospital and was going to apologize for the accident. I had no reason to doubt otherwise. My Lydia was faithful to me. I put my arm around Connie and just held her tight. We decided to make several copies of Lydia's letter and give them to our parents and Derek's parents. They could stop the rumor. We didn't have to deal with that anymore. Now new rumors were circulating. Dylan was telling people that his mom and I would probably get married and I would be his and Darlene's new dad. Time will show. In the following days, we received our phone bills. There were only four calls from Lydia. One was before the days they were together, and one on the day they met. Six months have passed since this all happened.
No further information has been released regarding Lydia and Derek's meetings. Connie checked a few more of her numbers and found Derek's latest girlfriend. It wasn't Lydia. We received our insurance claims and they stated that there was no foul play on the vehicles. Everything was mostly settled when I received a call from Connie. Jerry, can you come over right now? I have something I want to share with you. I'll be there in a minute, I said. What might she want to share? Lydia and Derek's case was mostly closed. I was at her door in ten minutes. She opened the door and pulled me inside. She didn't say a word, but she kissed me with one of those very sensual kisses. We kissed again and again. Jerry, are you ready to make love to me? Yes, Connie, I'm ready. We went to the bedroom and made love. Not just sex, not quickly, but sensually loved each other for a whole hour. After that day, we became a couple and let everyone know about it. We knew that the wedding date was just around the corner. Life can be cruel. There may be many obstacles along the way. Nobody ever said life would be easy, but as a friend once told me, every storm ends and you might see a rainbow.